Good evening and welcome to this special programme on Kristallnacht, exploring the night German civilization shattered. My name is Stephen Wilson and I'm the Chief Executive of the United Synagogue. Before I introduce this evening's feature, I know that many of you, like me, will still be reeling from the awful news of the passing of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. He was, as our President Michael Goldstein said yesterday, a rabbi and a leader, a father and a grandfather, and a teacher of us all. His writings will continue to be studied for generations to come. We wish Lady Elaine, their three children, Rabbi Sachs's three brothers, and the entire family, Chaim Aruchim, a long life. We will find an appropriate way to mark Rabbi Sachs's unique contribution to the Jewish community and wider world in due course. This evening's programme is presented by the National Holocaust Centre and Museum and the United Synagogue. Tomorrow, November the 9th, 2020, will mark 82 years since Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, or put another way, the first organised Nazi pogrom against the Jews. But far from it being, as the Nazi propaganda presented it, a spontaneous and justified uprising, uprising by German citizens, it was a planned and carefully orchestrated campaign. Shuls and Jewish businesses were destroyed. Jews were beaten up and taken to concentration camps. Days later, any Jewish children who remained in German schools were expelled. Jews were excluded from the social welfare system, banned from theatres and cinemas, and had their driving licenses rescinded. Why was Kristallnacht such a turning point in the Nazis' relentless crusade against the Jews? That's the question that we'll try to answer this evening. I'm delighted that the United Synagogue is partnering with the National Holocaust Center and Museum in what I hope will be the first of a number of fruitful collaborations following a very well-received recent partnership with Southampton Synagogue. I'm pleased now to hand over to the Center's Chief Executive, Mark Cave. Mark, please. Thank you, Stephen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as you said, what a, what a sad and heavy day of remembrance uh, it is today. Not just that it's Remembrance Day, but uh, we've lost uh, a true great, uh, uh, I wish Rabbi Sachs's family a long life from everyone at the uh, National Holocaust Centre and Museum. He, he, I think he visited us. He certainly inspired us all. And actually, he was one of the, um, one of the very first people we wanted uh, in addition to our survivors to be part of our forever project, um, which is all about preserving. Um, the ability to have a, a conversation with with special people, with role models, um, um, for now and evermore. Um, he was at the top of that list for us. Uh, uh, there is no necklace large enough for all the pearls of brilliant wisdom um, that he had to offer us all. Um, and I should say that when it came to the Holocaust, that was, of course, no exception. Um, and I just want to read you before we go into tonight's thing, um, if I may, um, something that he said, which I, I, I personally find um, profound, uh, as, as uh, with so many of his pearls. He was talking once, I think, in giving a sheer about, about how we overcome trauma. Uh, and I read from what he said. I learned the answer to this from the people who became my mentors in moral courage, the Holocaust survivors I had the privilege to know. How I wondered did they keep going, knowing what they knew, seeing what they saw. The survivors I knew had the most tenacious hold on life. How did they keep going? Eventually I discovered. Most of them didn't talk about the past, even to their marriage partners, even to their children. Instead, they set about creating a new life in a new land. They learned its language and customs. They found work, they built careers, they married and had children. They looked forward, not back. First, they built a future. Only then, sometimes 40 or 50 years later, did they speak about the past. That was when they told their story, first to their families and then to the world. First, you have to build a future. Only then can you mourn the past. We're not here by accident. We're here because God wanted us to be and because there is a task we were meant to fulfill. Discovering what that is, is not easy and often takes many years and full starts. But for each of us, there is something God is calling on us to do. A future not yet made that awaits our making. It is future orientation that defines Judaism as a faith. If you reverse the order, you will be held captive by the past. You will be unable to move on. So much of the anger, hatred and resentments of this world are brought about by people obsessed by the past 
and who are unable to move on. There's no good ending to this kind of story, only more tears and more tragedy. We must first build the future. Only then can you mourn the past. And so to tonight's story. On the 7th of November, 1938, in Paris, a young Polish Jew called Herschel Grunspan walked into the German embassy and shot a diplomat called Ernst von Russ. In Berlin, only two nights later, the 9th of November, 1938, violent mobs went on the riot, smashing up Jewish shops, homes, synagogues, and people. A three-year-old Jewish girl called Ruth Michaelis was staying that night in Berlin with her aunt and grandmother. Her father and brother were out on the streets. They caught wind of the riot that was gonna happen earlier that afternoon, and they decided the best place to hide was in amongst the rioting mob itself. That way no one would think they were Jewish. Meanwhile, over in Vienna, on the very same night, at the very same time, uh, uh, a young Austrian Jewish girl of eight and three quarter years called Hedwig Schnabel was at home with her mother in Schwechat, which is a, a, a suburb of Vienna. Terrified for her life, and meanwhile her father, a prominent Jewish lawyer, was in prison for criticizing the state. And for his own safety, he was being kept there by a friendly guard to prove to um, protect him from the mob. Now these riots, as Stephen alluded to, took place not just in Berlin and Vienna, but uh, in towns and cities throughout Germany and Austria and Sudetenland, all at the same time, all in the same way. Now we know that um, young Herschel Grunspan ended up in Buchenwald, and after that we know not. But Ruth Michaelis and Hedwig, or Hedy Schnabel, survived that night and many more years, and I'm delighted to say they're here tonight to tell us all about what we now know as Kristallnacht. Hello, Ruth. Hello. Hedy. Now Hello. Ruth Barnett. Hi. Now Ruth Barnett, MBE, and Hedy Argent, MBE. Um, we're also going to be joined shortly, if not right now, by Dr. Paula Cowan. There she is, popping up. In the Good evening. Hello. Hello. Um, let me just allow, allow me just to introduce the three of you briefly. Um, so first of all, Hedy. Um, uh, you consider yourself, it says here, Hedy, uh, one of the lucky ones. Your father survived Kristallnacht and the family managed to get visas for England just in time before the beginning of the Second World War. The father was never able to practice his profession again. The mother never recovered from the loss of most of her large family. Hedy, you wanted to become an English girl, quote unquote, <laughs> and that's what you most certainly did. What an accent, what a refined accent that we're all going on to hear. <laughs> And you only began to look back and to tell your story when you became an adult. After the birth of two daughters, trained to become a social worker, and you're now a, a proud grandmother and looking forward to becoming a great grandmother. Mother top. Ruth, Ruth Michaelis, now Ruth Barnett, MBE, uh, got out of Berlin and came to England age four with your brother Martin, uh, age seven, on the Kinder Transport, I think in February, was it, of 39? February, yes. Uh, in England, um, the ordeal kind of continued. Uh, you survived three foster families and a hostel, and, it was, and you were repatriated back to Berlin 10 years later, age 14, against your wishes, when your father returned from refuge in Shanghai. Uh, and you chronicle this extended ordeal in your autobiography, Person of No Nationality, which is available on Amazon, it says here. You've also written your family experience as a play, What Price for Justice, which you'll talk about tonight. Uh, you returned to England within the year, married a British Jew, had three children and two grandchildren. You were a secondary school teacher for 19 years and retrained as a psychotherapist. And for the last 20 odd years, you've been talking in schools and adult groups on Holocaust education and related issues. And you've written several books and papers. And may I just say that both of you are wonderful friends of uh, what we all call Beth Shalom, National Holocaust Centre Museum. And, and might I also add, you've been a complete marvel during lockdown, helping us deliver uh, all the school programs to the primary and secondary online. Um, so thank you for that. Paula, uh, let me now introduce Paula. Hello, Paula, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, I've got a note about you. Uh, and here's what it says. You're a reader in education at the University of the West of Scotland, a member of the UK delegation to the International Holocaust Research Alliance, you're a director of Vision Schools Scotland, and mm -hmm. I, I know best of all, you're a member of our own academic advisory board. 
And um, thank you for joining us. I know you're going to be putting into context uh, in, in the, in the, at the meta level um, what Ruth and Hedy will be talking to us about. So, as the introduction is over, I, I um, just want to show, if I may, before we start chatting to each other, um, a clip of German newsreel um, with some comments on it as well by a, a post war German uh, uh, commentator, which really just sets the scene visually and shows the, if I might say, the satanic brilliance of the Nazis in, in um, orchestrating events. Attentat. Ein 17-Jähriger namens Herschel Grünspan erschießt in Paris einen jungen deutschen Diplomaten. Ernst vom Rat, dritter Sekretär an der deutschen Botschaft dort. Aber die Tat vom 6. November 38 wird aufgeputscht zur Nationalschmach. Tausende grüßten den jungen Diplomaten auf seiner letzten Fahrt in die Heimat. So ominös sind Züge kaum über Gleise gerollt. So drohend nicht in Bahnhöfe eingefahren. Nachzutragen ist, über allen Bombast hinweg, zumindest das Motiv des jungen Grünspan. Seine Eltern gehörten zu den 17.000 polnischen Juden, die in Deutschland lebten und im Herbst 1938 brüsk abgeschoben wurden. Da Polen sie nicht aufnahm, kampierten sie im elendesten Niemandsland. Der Verzweiflungsakt Grünspans machte ihnen in der Tat auf internationalen Druck hin den Weg nach Polen hinein frei. Der Führer nahm an der Trauerfeier teil und erwies seinem treuen Mitkämpfer die letzte Ehre. Und von Staats wegen bricht nun ein Pogrom los, nur noch eben gebändigt vom Hymnenklang. Das Attentat wird zum Vorwand für das, was den absurden Namen Reichskristallnacht bekommen hat. Geschäfte werden geplündert, Wohnungen gestürmt, Synagogen angezündet, Juden werden verhöhnt und misshandelt und in den Tagen nach dem 9. November, dem Beginn des Pogroms, werden 26.000 verhaftet. Der äußeren Zerstörung, die mit der Sprengung der Synagogen fortgesetzt wird, entspricht seit langem wirtschaftliche Ruinierung und gesellschaftliche Entrechtung der deutschen Juden. Noch am 12. November wird ihnen als Sühneleistung für den Mord an vom Rat eine Zahlung von einer Milliarde Reichsmark auferlegt. Mit einer Verordnung zur Ausschaltung der Juden aus dem deutschen Wirtschaftsleben wird ihnen die Existenzgrundlage entzogen. Die 250.000 noch in Deutschland lebenden Juden dürfen auch schon in kein Theater, Kino, Konzert mehr. Ihre Bewegungsfreiheit wird eingeschränkt. Die Zwangsvornamen Sarah und Israel sind zur Vorform des Judensterns geworden. Mit dem Turm der ältesten Dresdner Synagoge sind auch die letzten Illusionen über ein Leben in diesem Land dahin. And thank you to History Vision Berlin, um, who uh, will be showing that footage courtesy of Paula. Um, there's an awful lot in that video. Um, can I just start by asking you, um, how do you decode all of that? Um, well, <laughs> I think the first thing uh, just to say is that um, <laughs> the reason for Kristallnacht, um, the Nazis wanted to give um, Herschel Greenspan the reason for, for Kristallnacht. In fact, that was that was very convenient for them. Um, and then it, and, but really it was it was really an excuse. I mean, uh, Herschel Greenspan was 17 years of age. He was born in Hanover. Um, he had this assassination. Um, I, I think you can see from the from the clip it was a response to finding out that that his that his parents had been deported in boxcars to Poland. He himself had left Hanover because of the little opportunity to find work in Hanover. So he had gone to Paris to live with family and find some work. Um, and so this he this was a protest. He said when he was arrested, being a Jew is not a crime. I'm not a dog. I have a right to live and the Jewish people have a right to exist on the earth. 
So it was a very nice reason, but really it was it was an excuse. It was a pretext. It wasn't a real reason. We all know that that, that to organise what the Nazis organised uh, for Kristallnacht must have taken a long, long, long uh, time to plan, much longer than a couple of days between the assassination yeah. and Kristallnacht. So they've got the but, they got the plan on ice, and they're looking for the opportune people moment. People bought it. People Press, bought yeah. it. It gave them it gave them the reason they wanted. Yeah. So then, um, could you explain perhaps a bit about how how um, they by what process the the, the von Rath shooting in Paris then leads to everything else only two days later, and why actually more than anything else, why does Kristallnacht become such a turning point? Yeah, it was a turning point for, for many German and Austrian Jews. There's absolutely no doubt about that. There are many reasons for that, Mark. The first would be the scale. And, and I think in, in the film, you've got some idea of the scale. What you don't get from that wonderful archival film that you've just seen is actually the sound of the broken glass. Because mm. it was mayhem. It was mayhem for, for whatever it was, 24, 40 hours. Uh, across Germany, across Austria in the sedating land. I think you saw um, a synagogue there being burned um, or damaged. Now, um, th there were um, synagogues in, in Munich and certainly in Nuremberg that year had been previously de destroyed, but these were more isolated cases. But Kristallnacht, we had more than 1,000 synagogues being burned and damaged. There was also unprecedented violence. The, the, the rioters ransacked and looted Yes, they looted Jewish businesses, but they looted thousands of Jewish businesses. They vandalized Jewish hospitals, Jewish homes, Jewish schools, Jewish cemeteries. Um, and some of the people who were doing that vandalism did not wear Nazi uniform. They were civilians, and some of them would have been Jewish neighbors. Mm -hmm. The police were on the streets to arrest the victims, not the perpetrators. Yeah. Fire companies um, were, were, were on standby with instructions, let these buildings burn. They were to intervene only if a fire threatened the adjacent Aryan properties. And of course, we know that there was um, less than 100, sorry, there was less than 100 uh, Jews who were actually murdered. And I think the third reason for saying it was a turning point hmm. was that this was the first time that Nazi officials made these massive arrests of Jewish, predominantly males, two Jewish male between the ages of 16 and 60. And they all were marched to Buchenwald, to, to Dachau, to Sassenhausen. Um, so this realization that, that, that this was happening to the cultivated, civilized Germany, it must have been unbearable for German and Austrian Jews. They must have asked themselves how they were going to survive at that point. And, and of course, this prompted the planning of the Kinder transport operation, um, because the, the parents would have known that time was indeed running out. I think it's amazing that they managed to get the first trans the kinder transport over to the UK by the 2nd of December. So, yes, it was a turning point for, 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 for some. But one would ar could argue, I think, that it was all oh, that turning point would have come earlier for others. It certainly came earlier for, for poor um, Henrik uh, he, he, um, Greenspan. Uh, Greenspan, Herschel Greenspan. I'm thinking this turning point was much earlier than that because mm. uh, he was just so frustrated. Um, but certainly German Jews had lived in Germany under the Nuremberg laws since 1935. I mean, that was that's three years of, of, of being disqualified from their German citizenship and all the, the accompanying rights that that comes with. And so from being alienated from German society as the other, they were now being completely excluded from everyday aspects of, of, of general life. Um, and I know that one of the, the kinder, one of the kinder who came to uh, Glasgow in 1938 when she was 13 years of age, and she was also from Berlin, the late Rosa Zagreb, she said that in her testimony that her father was arrested and imprisoned in 1935 alongside about a couple of hundred other Jewish men. Why? Because they broke or they offended the Nuremberg laws. And as part of that punishment, um, the state deprived him of financial assets. And as a result, her mother was left without any means to, to, to bring up Rosa and her children. And Rosa was sent into a home at that time. So for some people, it, the tap turning point must have come earlier. And I know that in, in Vienna in 1937, there was a group of Jews in Vienna who had been rounded up in Shabbos and forced to eat grass as a local amusement park. So the humiliations had, had occurred earlier too. 
it is also important to remember that 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 the AVN conference had occurred a few months earlier, where delegates from more than 30 countries had come together to discuss um, what to do with these hundreds and thousands of, of, of Jewish refugees. And they expressed sympathy and they listened. But so the larger countries, mm. yeah, they did not increase their immigration quota. And so yeah. they were not, there was not going to be a big impact. So that they must have thought some of these people you know, how do I get out of here? No, who's going to help us? So the turning point would would have come earlier uh, for for some people, uh, for for sure. Yeah. And it's quite interesting because one of the things you mentioned that I work at the Inter I, I do work for the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, um, and last year they brought out their new uh, recommendations. Now, thank you for teaching and learning the Holocaust, which I was very delighted and privileged to be part of, and in it. Uh, their definition of the Holocaust for, for, for teachers and educators explains quite, quite explicitly that, that the Holocaust was a state-sponsored systematic persecution and murder of Jews by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945. Of course, in its definition, it recognises that the height of the persecution and murders occurred in the context of the Second World War, but it does also recognize the importance of these Nuremberg trials and the impact, of course, of Kristallnacht. Indeed. You, you um, showed a very interesting picture um, a few minutes ago um, about the, the, uh, the roundups and the arrest, you know, the, the people being um, arrested and, and marched on. And of course, ultimately, yes, I mean, look at those, look at those people having fun with their camera on the grassy bank on top looking at all. I mean, unbelievable. But of course, I'm not sure how many people know this, that, that the camps had already been set up. So a lot of those people, they were being around there wanted to be taken to Buchenwald, um, et cetera. Uh, yeah, and there we have a picture of, of a roll call, I believe, at Buchenwald mm -hmm. in, what, 38? So again, yeah. I'm not sure, you know, again, you speak about, about the turning point being early. Yeah, there were uh, uh, you know, several turning points, were there not? Um, okay, the, the, the other very interesting um, thing about this sort of uh, definition of turning point, I suppose, is you, mm -hmm. you and I, before about um, how it was a moment, a, a test moment for Hitler in terms of the international reaction. So um, I think we've got some um, newspaper cuttings here from around the world. So there was an awful lot of, I guess, what we've now call virtue signaling. Daily Express, mm -hmm. uh, got here, looting mob, defy Goebbels. Uh, the FT were talking about the, the insurance companies being worried about um, the impact of these shops being destroyed. Um, but actually, I think, uh, good old Jewish Chronicle, 1938 as well. Um, I think, yes, there's a picture here. This is the only, this is the point I wanted to make. This is the only example I'm aware of. Uh, this is an ad placed in the Jewish Chronicle that year by Rothschilds, the bankers. Um, is the only example of someone actually doing something to help by trying to fundraise and get them out and raise the alarm. All the other... Um, Geschrei around the world in the US papers. I, know, I think Roosevelt was talking about it. Um, Herbert Hoover was talking about it. Uh, there was various virtue signaling in the UK. No one actually did anything. So I think I'm right in saying, aren't I, Paul, that for Hitler, that was a really important turning point because it, it, it was a test. Would the world tolerate him going to the next stage against the Jews and making it physical? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 if, if when you look at the history of, of the Holocaust, you, you could see that it wasn't just one event. It was a process of different events. Yeah. Like one, what, something else led to the other. The, you had the concentration camps and they were used for this purpose and indeed others. Be, there were other groups of people that ended up in concentration camps, as we all know. And that wasn't enough. The next thing was to segregate them, put them into ghettos. What was happening next after that, the final solution. So as soon as one... One, one part of that process is happens and is accepted and nobody's doing anything about it, that signals, let's go on to the next, the next part of the process. And that's exactly what happened because the ideas of the final solution were, were not even, I don't think, even thought of in 1938. Yeah. But they thought of it. Yeah. Okay, well, this is all pretty potent stuff and that's the big picture. Can I, I'd love to bring uh, Heidi back in now. Um, she hasn't got, got bored of us and gone away. I hope not. There she is, hello, Heidi. Um, so obviously, this is uh, we're back, back now to Kristallnacht. Um, 
and and I think I'm right in saying, aren't I, that, that, that you know, your your family, many many people, if not the Nazis themselves, wouldn't have had the time or the ability to take pictures or let alone video footage or cine footage. So the importance of eyewitness accounts by people like yourself is unbelievably important for history and for learning. We just don't have any of it. So it will be fascinating if you wouldn't mind just sharing with us how it was that night for you and your family. What was going on? Okay. Well, on November the 9th, 1938, my father was due to be released from prison. Now, he'd had a six-week sentence for offending the Third Reich. And he was a lawyer and his own practice had been requisitioned and he was now an assistant to an Aryan lawyer in the center of Vienna. And he had been in court to defend a communist who had forged a passport in order to be able to get out of the country. And my father said in court that in a country that persecuted its citizens for its beliefs, forgery should probably not be considered a crime. And for that, he got a six week sentence. Now, on November the 9th, when he was due to come out, my mother went to the prison, the central prison in Vienna on the Rossauer Lende, and she waited. And she waited and she waited. And she didn't dare ask for information because she was too anxious about being arrested herself. And she came home. And my father didn't. And we waited together. I was nine years old. I understood what it was all about. He didn't come. We, we lived at the time on the second floor in the center of Vienna in a great block of flats. It was an abandoned flat from another Jewish lawyer who had fled the country and somehow this flat was empty and we were staying in it. And by the evening, we started hearing the strangest sounds and, and we went to the window and we looked out and it was eerie because there was noise. There was noise of shouting and, and we were used to that. There were always marauding gangs around in the center of Vienna at that time. But there was another sound and it was it was glass and it was breaking glass. And we, we couldn't understand what it was, but the sound was eerie. And, and then we smelt smoke. And then we saw flames and we didn't know what it was. We didn't know the synagogues were burning. We didn't know that Jewish windows were being smashed, but we, we, we saw it, we heard it and we smelled it. And my father didn't come home that night. And, and the next day there was a lot of talk and a lot of phone calls from friends and, and relatives saying that People had disappeared. People had been taken away. Where was my father? And it became very, very scary. And my father didn't come home that night either. That was the second night of, of the Kristallnacht. And the fires and the pogrom continued and no sign of my father. But the next day, my father came home. He was thin, emaciated, he looked grey, he'd been beaten, but he was safe, he came home. And this was his story. It, on the morning of Kristallnacht, of the first night of Kristallnacht, he was about to come home from the prison. He was ready to come home. He'd been officially discharged. And as he was going out, as he was at the door, a warden came up to him and said, go back, her doctor, 
It isn't safe out there. I'll hide you. And that's what he did. Now, apparently this warden had known my father when he had his own practice. And my father's practice was somewhat renowned for taking on people whose rights had been taken from them and who couldn't really afford to pay him. He was a defense lawyer with a bit of a name. And this warden apparently had known him when he was a lawyer with his own practice. And he saved my father and my father came home. And I've often wondered what happened to that warden. I don't even know his name. I don't even know if my father knew his name. But surely I often think he must have been one of the first of the righteous Gentiles. And I thank him. Duff, um, um, I remember you saying um, when we were speaking earlier, or I think it was last week, um, also about not just about what it, what, it, what it had been generally like that you'd been sleeping on, you'd, been, you'd lost your home, you'd been expelled from school, and you were sleeping on various people's couches. Can you tell us a bit about well, that? Well, yes. Um, as, as soon as the Anschluss happened, all the anti Semitism that had been around for many years uh, became legal, <laughs> it became the law. And um, within the first month we lost our home, it was taken over by an Aryan family, um, part of the Aryanization. And we had no choice, we, we had no rights, we, there was nothing we could do, it was the law. So from then on, we went from place to place where anybody had a few couches or a couple of couches. Um, and the, the flat that we were in on Kristallnacht, uh, as I said, was had been the flat of a of another uh, lawyer who had managed to get away, and uh, for some reason it was just left there. It hadn't been requisitioned, so we stayed there for a while. Then, in the end, we were found there, and we had to move again. But it was just a question of of staying, finding somewhere just to just to <laughs> you know keep keep alive. And were you in daily fear, depression? Or oh, yes, scared, scared all the time, all the time. Um, yes, and, and increasingly so. Yes, I can well imagine. Um, it'd be nice to bring in Ruth. Uh, passport it. photograph. That was your passport photograph. Well, it's my passport photograph. It's quite interesting that it shows my left ear because um, the the Nazis said that oh, criminals had to show their left ear when they had their photo taken. Yeah. And uh, so all of us had to show our left ear on our passport photographs. Why left ear? I don't know, but apparently that's what that's what you what criminals do when you when you have your photo taken uh, when you when you go to prison, you show your left ear. I don't know why. Um, and so we had to sh make sure that we showed our left ear. I didn't when I had I remember my... as a child finding that very, very odd and troublesome. Mm. Bizarre, bizarre. Um, thank you for sharing that anyway. Um, Ruth, hi, I think you're on, uh, you're on mute. Now you're not. Hi. Um, so, of course, Ruth McKay is then. We find it now. Um, you were only three, as you were saying earlier, on, on that same night. Um, but you have a very dear brother, Martin. Who was four years older than you, I believe, uh, and he was the one that told you about that time. But wh what did he tell you? What was going on? In your um, first, I would just like to say that uh, Kristallnacht was really the big test after the Avian Conference showed that nobody wanted to take Jews. This was a test to see if any country would intervene. Mm. And of course they didn't. 
uh, there was virtue signaling but no intervention and that is sadly happening today there is virtue signaling about the Uyghur being uh, subjected to cultural genocide uh, in China, but there is no intervention that I know of. Uh, we haven't found a way of actually doing what's necessary. Um, I was three and uh, on Kristallnacht, and I was tucked away safely with my mother's mother, my granny and my aunt, uh, they were a Christian family, so that it was relatively safe. I knew absolutely nothing about Kristallnacht until much, much later. And I only learned from my brother uh, when we were adults and being interviewed by a researcher. He suddenly came out with this story that on Kristallnacht, um, our dad had got wind of something uh, happening. He didn't know what, but he uh, took my brother, who also counted as a Jew, um, and they walked on the edge of the rioting crowd in Berlin that night, the safest place for Jews to be. Um, it saved both their lives, but my father had been on the run ever, ever since 1933 when he objected to being, being turned out of his court. He was a judge in Berlin and he didn't see why he should leave his post, as all professionals were ordered to, uh, purely so that the Nazis could replace all the Jews in the medical and legal professions with Nazi party members uh, and take over the legal and medical professions very, very quickly. So my dad was on a blacklist. He was on the run. He was used to taking a rucksack on his back. And sometimes he took Martin, aged six, with him. And they simply disappeared into the woods, sometimes for several days. Um, uh, so he was used to doing that. But um, I was astonished when that story came out. Uh, my brother had never talked about it. And this has always puzzled me. We were together um, for the whole 10 years we were separated from our parents, but we never seemed to discuss what was going on. And my brother was always very reluctant uh, to talk about it. Um, so was I until I was 54 and Bertha Leverton organized the reunion of Kinder Transport. Uh, that was when it became safe to talk. I had no idea that there were 10,000 of us that came over on the Kinder Transport and they all had stories to tell. Up till that time, I had completely cut off my roots and couldn't talk about it because I wanted to be 101% English. What a story, what a story. Um, can I, um, you know, when you were saying before, Ruth, um, about about uh, people just uh, all talk and no action, um, I've got a, a, um, an opinion poll here from America in 19, November 1938, um, after Kristallnacht, and uh, the poll asked, uh, do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany, in the States? 94% disapprove. Makes you wonder about the 6% that approve. But anyway, 94% pretty strong. And then the second question was, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to live? And do you know how many said yes and how many said no? Have a guess. Reverse number. Pretty much. 71% said no don't want them to come. So that might explain in part why people don't like to step up and stand up. Um, but as you say, with the Uyghurs, maybe it's just uh, a bit of indifference. Um, so I do take your point, I must say. Um, tell us um, more a bit, bit more about um, about your dad uh, and the, uh, I think Hedy, it was mentioned before about this process of Aryanization. Um, 
and then being replaced in the judiciary, etc. Just tell us a little bit more about that. Very interesting. Um, well, my dad escaped at the last moment in in um, May, June 1939 to Shanghai. There was hardly anywhere in the world where it was possible for Jews to find refuge, but 20,000 found refuge in Shanghai. Um, and he was able to establish a legal practice in Shanghai after he had taught himself British law and Chinese because uh, uh, it was un Shanghai was under British law and his clients were Chinese. He did quite well once he had that. And he came back to Europe, to Germany, determined not only to uh, reunite his family, but to restore justice. And first of all, he had to fight to get his German nationality back. Uh, because he couldn't get a job as a displaced person. And then when he did get a job as a judge, he found himself in a profession, a legal profession that was 80% occupied by former Nazis who had never left their post and were simply continuing to interpret the law in the Nazi way. And he had a battle with that. Um, uh, it is such a story that I've written a play. Um, uh, that's it. Uh, I I wrote that play because my son suggested the play, and he uh, produced it with his amateur drama group in Liverpool two years ago. And if anyone's interested, I've got lots of spare copies. That was the uh, program script. I've got lots of spare copies at home. Good to know. We can give out uh, details of that afterwards. Um, so um, this process of Aryanization then, can I bring Paula back in? Um, it'd be good to just to touch on that in a little bit more, Paula. Um, I gather that there were orders actually placed for homes and Jewish goods. Well, yes. I mean, people had a great, um, a lot, a lot to gain from Aryan from Aryanization. Um, they had they had financial gains to to, to make, and also self interest, as they knew they would be promoted or rewarded by the Nazi Party. Um, so, Aryanization had actually taken place in the 1930s. It wasn't just um, at Kristallnacht. It had the Aryanization of Jewish owned businesses had begun in the 1930s with the yeah. expropriation and transferring to non-Jewish ownership. And this, of course, helped um, the Nazis exclude the Jews from business of the commerce world. After Kristallnacht, though, um, Aryanization of Jewish owned businesses was drastically increased. Jews were forbidden from being business managers. They had to employ non-Jewish surrogates or employers who, who soon, employees rather, who soon took over their whole business. Um, and I think it's important because when you learn about the Holocaust and when you understand, you, it, the learning of the Holocaust tends to be dominated by events, such as Christmas, which is terribly important. But it's usually about events and occurrences. And sometimes I think, and I think listening to Ruth's testimony, it's really, really interesting to see the impact of the Aryanization and how, how that spread in the 1930s. Because it was, I mean, what I've just described was sometimes referred to as the greatest theft in history. And yes. I'm very glad that it's written a play about it. <laughs> well, I, I think it's pretty, it's pretty good stuff as well. But of course, you know, it's the, it's the, I think what must get us all uh, is the, well, amongst many things, is the nauseating um, enthusiasm of ordinary people. You know, this is not just about um, the Third Reich, um, uh, Hitler, and the SA, the SS, whatever. There is a, an incredible um, enthusiasm, isn't there, of ordinary German Austrian citizens to take part. Um, it's partly bloodlust, as we've seen in some of that footage and pictures, but also this economic opportuni opportunism. Um, I think we've got a few more um, images, actually, which are quite uh, interesting to see. So um, this um, is a street scene morning after of Kristallnacht, uh, the pogrom. Um, just go back one, whoever's uh, controlling this, if you would, thank you. Um, 
on the left of that street, you can see all of the glass and being being um, um, swept up, cleaned up. But on the other side of the street, look at all that. That is all German people absolutely enjoying the spectacle and, of course, not helping take part, um, help help with the cleanup. But then it gets worse. There's there's serious glee at Jewish misfortune to the extent that you've got a picture here of kids being allowed by their parents to play the morning after in amongst the rubble of uh, uh, Jewish homes destroyed. And I think even in, in synagogues. Um, yeah, there we go. That's a picture of three German kids um, having a laugh, having a bit of a play um, in, in a destroyed um, shul. Extraordinary, happy playing amongst the ruins. And then, of course, there was the graffiti, um, which we've all seen mm. before. Um, but what I think gets me is the um, is, is pictures like this. Um, this is a bedding shop uh, in Germany. I'm not sure which town it was. And I, I can almost see the spiteful smile on, on the faces of the graffiti, uh, whoever's doing the graffiti. Um, because what they've put here, there's, there's a description on that left-hand pillar. I don't know if everyone can see, um, possibly not, but it, it describes the things that the shop sells. Um, children's uh, beds, uh, uh, quilts, covers, etc. And of course, it, so it says Yiddish above it, which means Jewish beds, Jewish quilts, Jewish duvets. Um, and then it says underneath it, mit Knoblauch. And that means with garlic. And uh, I gather um, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, if you were a fan of garlic, it meant that you were the lowest of the low. So Jews, uh, Jewish bedding shops sold, sold quilts and duvets and bed covers with garlic in it. I mean, the absolute glee of the Jew hate um, seemed to know no bounds, um, physical, verbally, as well as the economic side of it. Um, and on and on it went, of course. Uh, I think we've got other pictures here. It wasn't just individual shops. It was the entire parades, so entire parades of shops um, up and down the country, all over Germany, all over Austria. Um, so um, there, there, just, there's one um, clip um, that I'd like to show. And this is a, 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 a picture. Obviously, it's very, very grainy, but there are very few pictures of people actually in flagrante, you know, um, um, these aren't soldiers you can see. These are um, young guys, civilians, absolutely going at it hammer and tong. And I think actually you can see in the middle of the picture, um, there's somebody um, about to throw a punch. At, so it's, it's about the destroying of the property, but also um, um, smashing Jewish people themselves too. Um, there's one little video clip, though, I'd like to just show as well, if there's time. Um, because, again, to that point about the world realizing what was going on, um, it really is brought home to me by a clip of a, 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 a pastor in New York um, who really understood everything that was going on and commenting on, on the brutality of the situation. I think we've got this clip coming up right now. It's about a 30 second clip. Maybe not. People are talking again about a new barbarian invasion of Europe. But this time there's a difference. The original Huns had always been barbarians. But the Nazis had been born in a civilized fatherland. A glorious old Germany, rich with spiritual and intellectual traditions, full of splendid universities and fine old churches. This fact makes the recent orgy of frightfulness a thing of very deep significance. For here we see another fall from grace. Here again, we see the perfect flower of pride, love of self, pushed even to contempt for God. Sorry for the delay in the transmission there, but I hope um, everybody got to see that. Did you see that, Paula? Yes, I did. 
Oh, good. Well, hopefully, everyone else out there too. Then, as well. <laughs> I'm sure everybody else. Uh, yeah, you know, I think for me that just just some. I know we're we're probably running a bit over time, but for me that that just brings it back to the whole theme of this, you know, of tonight's um, discussion, is that uh, a turning point in terms of, of civilization, of civility, absolutely um, being smashed to smithereens. Uh, an a, an educated uh, uh, bunch of people, highly civilized, lovers of art, lovers of culture, um, um, gleefully becoming feral murderous savages um extraordinary um as i said well, i think we're, we're 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 probably overrunning our schedule a bit so um i i just wanted to ask paula you one more question and i'd love it if if ruth and eddie could comment a bit about on, on this too because i know um they have strong opinions um um i guess to wrap things up paula um how how do you think that kristallnacht the november pogrom um contributes to young people's understanding of the Holocaust, because in the end, all the education we do, it's primarily. <laughs> I think I've got two minutes to do this then, Mark. Okay, I'll do it in 30 seconds if I can. Okay. Um, I, I think obviously it helps in understanding the history lessons of the Holocaust. But aside from that, in addition to that, you've got the lessons from the Holocaust. Um, this was a hate crime and it was a hate crime specifically towards Jews. So mm. it's a perfect opportunity to really get teachers, educators to discuss anti-Semitism, the roots of anti-Semitism, the understand its significance in Nazi ideology, and indeed its manifestations today. Ruth's already talked about human rights, and, and she's absolutely right. And that there's there are it's a this can be a very powerful resource for developing the understanding of the importance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right for everybody to live in freedom and in safety and not to be arrested and put in prison or sent away from their country whenever whenever other people want them to and 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 the, and the right to, to not so that we're not allowing anybody the right to, to subject anyone else to cruel or inhumane treatment and and, and roots correctly identified the, the Uyghurs in China and, and there are also the Rohingya in Myanmar and other ethnic minorities who at the moment today do not have basic human rights and and, and finally I'll just I'll just talk about the, the refugees because we have since like 2015 a massive refugee crisis and there is a huge similarity between the desperation and the plight of Jewish refugees in the 1930s and the plight of refugees from a wide range of backgrounds today whether they're being persecuted in Syria, Afghanistan, Myanmar, wherever. Um, and finally, I would say that there are, if we're just relating it to the Kinder Transport, approximately 3,000 unaccompanied children applied for asylum in the UK last year. So these lessons can be can be from the Holocaust can be used very nicely um, in by learning about Kristallnacht. And I don't know we're running out of time, so I don't know if we're going to have time for the last the last clip. You tell me, Mark. Yeah, go on, go for it. Oh, all right, okay, <laughs> okay. Well, the National Holocaust Centre Museum has produced an innovative. Um, resource uh, which is primarily for primary age pupils age 9 to 11 uh, which tells of the Jewish life in Berlin before Kristallnacht and it ends with its character Leo uh, a young boy leaving on a kinder transport the resource I've been involved with I've given some some support to the centre with but the resource is an app and it provides an interactive multi-sensory experience where learners can explore and navigate virtual spaces and there's Leo, and also engaged with an age appropriate narrative. And I hope we've got time to show you just a very, very brief clip from this resource that focuses what we've talked about this evening, Kristallnacht. Oh gosh, okay. So we're looking for smashed things and evidence of torching. The shoe shop was down here, wasn't it? Well, there's broken glass everywhere. Should more people have helped Leo's family? Mm. So I guess those are the kind of discussion questions that you would talk through after each chapter or during while looking at the objects. Mom? Dad? Leo? What are you doing here? 
I was sent home from school. Oh, what's happened? There have been more attacks on shops this morning. The vandals came back and looted our shop. It's all the Jewish shops, isn't it? It's the same shops that were marked with paint. Where is Dad? Is, is he okay? Some people who are not Jewish have taken him to a hideout where he'll be safe. Have they been upstairs? Yes, everywhere. They just leave us alone. <laughs> oh. There are people who don't want us here, Leo. But we are going to make a plan. So that was uh, an excerpt from the app aimed at uh, um, Key Stage 2 children um, and is available on the App Store. Um, all of you, all three of you, Paula, Hedy, Ruth, thank you very much um, um, for, for everything you've contributed tonight. Um, I think we're allowed to um, have five minutes of um, uh, putting questions to you, um, uh, if that's okay. Um, there are actually loads that have come in um, since you were talking, so I think we've probably got time for maybe three questions. So um, um, there's a question uh, for... Heidi, from um, um, somebody called Phoebe. Hello, Phoebe. Um, and Phoebe asks you, how far were you aware that businesses and homes, etc., were being requisitioned and the violence of Kristallnacht were taking place because you were Jewish? That's into a few questions. How far were you aware when the homes were being requisitioned um, were taking place because you were Jewish, particularly as you were very young? Ah, oh, well, very young. Uh, I grew up with the word anti-Semitism. Um, I was an only child. I heard adults talking. Uh, I was born in 1929. By 1933, Hitler was in power and very little else was talked about in Jewish homes. Um, so anti-Semitism I grew up with. I knew what it meant. I knew it meant that um, people didn't like me because I was Jewish. Um, I knew how it felt when I went to school because there was anti-Semitism and that was two years before the Anschluss. There was rampant anti-Semitism in the school. I was bullied, nobody would play with me. I wasn't included in any activities and the teachers supported all of that. Um, and then when the Anschluss came, everything became legal. Um, and that was the big change. But I certainly, by Kristallnacht, uh, when my father had been arrested, I understood what was happening pretty well. I mean, none of us knew while it was burning and while the glass was smashing exactly what was happening. We didn't know about that until the next days. But um, the smell and the sound, um, yeah. I can remember. And of course, this word itself, Kristallnacht, it was a, um, you know, it's a, it was a pogrom, and, and Kristallnacht kind of romanticizes it. Um, mm. That was a, a, a term I, I assume that was coined by the Nazis themselves. Were you? Did, did, did these events have a name for you at the time? Yes, as far as I remember, I think it was pretty well known as Kristallnacht pretty quickly. Um, but what, what we as Jews thought about that, that I don't know. Um, yeah. It was yeah. a pogrom. Okay. <laughs> Any um, other word. Yeah. Um, very interesting question here, actually, for Paula, but or, unless Ruth um, happens to know, which is um, from uh, Karen B. Um, with so many Jewish men having been arrested and sent to concentration camps, what impact did this have on the Jewish women? This is for me. It's <laughs> yeah, for you, but but, oh, but Ruth, raring to go. Um, Ruth, actually, to go. I found out long afterwards that my mother took part in the Rosenstrasse mm. protest. Wow. Uh, uh, the Nazis uh, started arresting uh, the spouses of uh, non-Jews. 
who were Jewish and uh, locking them up in prison or uh, a concentration camp. And the women organized a massive march in Rosenstrasse in Berlin. And uh, they um, really uh, had an effect because uh, the, the men who'd been arrested were all released. Um, there, there was a lot more resistance in Berlin uh, than people realize. The um, center of um, Jew hatred was um, in the south around, around Nuremberg. That was the center where the Nazis had their rallies, etc. The, the north of Germany, particularly Berlin, was uh, much more willing to hide Jews and protest. And the women were very effective. Thank you, thank you. Okay, one, one final question um, for anyone who cared to answer, which is from an Emma. Thank you for your question, Emma. Anti-Semitism ultimately became legal. What do you think is the most important thing we can do today to fight discrimination? Uh, well, I could, I, I'm, from an educator's point of view, I have mm. to say that um, I think there's a lot we can do um, I, I, in our schools at primary and at secondary school level. Um, I, I was, I'm, I'm very taken, Heidi, with, 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 with the point that you said you grew up not with anti-Semitism, but with the word anti-Semitism. I've actually written that down as you said it, because I don't think it's a word that our young people today necessarily understand. They may hear it, but even when they're engaging in Holocaust education, I don't think they fully understand it. Um, and I know, and I've just I've just spoken to, 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 to some secondary students quite recently whose school is, whose teachers are teaching it very, very effectively. And I, and I saw their programs of work and we asked them about anti-Semitism and they said, oh, there's this, this, all the stuff in the, in the newspapers and the media just now about the Labour Party. That's talking about anti-Semitism. But no, I don't really know what that means. And I'm thinking, why don't they know what that means? So I think as educators, we ought to do a bit better and we ought to make sure that we are in an age appropriate fashion, teaching anti-Semitism properly in the context of the Holocaust, in the context of anti-racism, um, so, that, so that our young people today do know what the word anti-Semitism actually means and can identify it when they meet it face to face or indeed on our online social media systems. Here, here. Well, I think we'll... We... <laughs> It sounded right. a bit political. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. We're all with you. No, absolutely. Um, Ruth, is, is it a quick one? Um, yes, I think uh, what we have to really take on board is that there is no such thing as a superior race and an inferior race. We all belong to one human race, and that needs to be right at the beginning of education, which is far too focused on training for exams and not enough focused on uh, emotional development. And also, we need to, I, I, I say this everywhere I get a chance, stop being a passive bystander when something is wrong and unacceptable. Do a little something to become an active upstander. Good words to close with. Everybody, thank you very much. Um, I think we better hand back to Stephen now at the United Synagogue. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Paula, for your fascinating and enlightening contributions this evening. But thank you in particular to the inspirational Heidi and Ruth. I can't begin to imagine what it must have been like for you to tell your story, but it's a privilege to be able to hear your testimony, for, testimony firsthand. In particular, just hearing about um, some of the details, the fact that it had become regular that there were marauding crowds in a, a cultured city like Vienna, uh, seeing the passport photograph and understanding, Heidi, why your left ear um, had, to be, uh, had to be uncovered. Uh, Ruth, uh, your reflections on, on refugees and on basic uh, human rights and on education today of such importance 
Uh, and Paula, I have to say, I heard it was for Key Stage 2, but I was completely uh, blown away by the app that, uh, that you showed us, which I think is going to play a vital role in uh, supporting uh, supporting engagement with uh, with the next generations. Thank you all so much for sharing your experiences with us this evening. The United Synagogue is part of the Leave the Light On campaign. Tomorrow evening, many of our communities are leaving a light on in their synagogues and at home, and you may wish to do so too. If you missed any of tonight's programme, it's now available to watch again on the US.tv, the United Synagogue's new on-demand video platform. Do check out the site for more meaningful and educational content. Thank you so much to the National Holocaust Centre and Museum for your partnership. And as I said earlier, I hope this will be the start of a number of fruitful collaborations. The work that you do to help school pupils, students, and the wider public understand the Holocaust is vital and may you go from strength to strength. Thank you all for watching and have a good evening.